Okay, so you come to a river, you've selected the river, you've done your research, you've done your homework, you try to figure out, well, what might be a good section of river to fish. You roll up to the river and how do you start? How do you know what fly to use? How do you know where to fish and what technique? Are you going to use a dry fly? Then imitate an adult insect? Are you going to use a, something that imitates the immature uh, insect? Are you going to imitate a little fish? Where do you start? Well, first of all, even before you get down to the water, you can look around and, and see, observe. Do you hear any birds singing? Birds around the river are a great thing because when there's an insect hatch going on, we'll often see swallows, you know, bluebirds, swifts, cedar waxwings out over the water eating insects. You don't see any flying around uh, looking for splashes on the water. There might be uh, fish feeding. You don't see any of that. And you can use the waiting staff to help make it up there. You want to get out of this tree. You can see what well, something hatched this morning, shaking through bushes. You see, uh, see if there could be any adult insects flying around. As you get down closer to the water, like when you're turning over rocks and observing the boulders, are there any stonefly exoskeletons on the rocks? Are we well, have some stoneflies been hatching today, yesterday, or the day before? If so, we're going to be around. They'll be mating. Maybe the fish will have been used to eating some of them. A uh, nice big piece of uh, juicy protein so that we could use a strong fly pen. We don't see any insects flying around. We don't see any evidence of any uh, adult insects like the exoskeletons. Then we start trying to think about what actually lives here. So I'm probably not going to be using a dry fly if I don't see any insect uh, evidence of adult insects. So now I've got to choose, okay, do I go with a nymph or do I go with a streamer? So I'm going to go down and I'm going to look and see what are the likely uh, kinds of insects that live in this river. Are there a lot of caddis? Are there any stoneflies? What is here? Uh, when I was looking around these rocks a little while ago, I did see a couple of small uh, crayfish, crud ants. That's an option. Almost every river has crud ants, has uh, baby fish of some sort or another. Uh, so that will help us decide. Then what really makes our decision is we look at the water. We selected this spot because it's a good location for fish to live. Why is that? It's got water of a good temperature. It has plenty of and uh, disturbance in the water which oxidates the water. The rapids upstream are just churning oxygen uh, into the water. So fish are going to be out here and they're going to be waiting for food to get washed down uh, with the current. So we can tell by looking at the sur surface of the water a good idea of what's going on underneath the water. How do we know that? Well, where the water is moving very fast, it's moving fast for a reason. It's either pinched together so there's less volume of, of bottom for it to go through, so it's being forced through at a greater speed. It could be pinched in between rocks, or it could be the depth. The depth is shallow, it goes faster. If it's deeper, it goes slower. So we look at changes in the speed of the surface of the water. And we have these real handy bubbles that are out there which will give us an indication of what's going on down underneath the water. So we can see it's very, very fast when it comes out of these rapids. And then it starts going at different speeds. And in the very middle, like right out here, we see uh, right over towards that rock that's sort of pyramid shape, it's going very, very slow. Well, why is that? Well, partly because the current has been divided and pushing fast current to the far side and to this side, but also partly because it's very deep out there compared to where it's shallow. So we're looking for areas where good oxygenation, good amount of fish food in the water, uh, insects, life, uh, little minnows, and we saw minnows uh, swimming around the edge. We might want to go with the streamer if we look to see any adult insects. And when we look at places where to, uh, to fish, Faster current with a lot of cover 
can help break that current will be good places for fish to hang out. We call these seams and transition zones. So a seam is an area between fast water and slow water, shallow water and deep water. Uh, fish will hang out on the slower side of that seam usually because it takes less energy, but they can dart out into the faster water or that faster water will bring them food and it'll wash over to the, into the slower water and they can wait there for food to gather. Also, if we look at the surface and we see oftentimes the uh, white bubbles will form up into what we call bubble lines or foam lines. And these can be feeding lanes for fish because it's like a funnel that funnels the food on the surface. It'll also funnel the food on the, the uh, bottom uh, of the river. Uh, it'll, it'll represent gathering spots for food and fish will hang out in those gathering spots. Some people say the foam is home. Look for the foam lines and you'll find the fish. So when uh, you're choosing your method of fishing, whether it's a nymph, a streamer, a dry fly, you want to take those uh, factors into account when uh, selecting your technique. Okay, so we stopped here. This is uh, a great place to get an idea about where fish might hang out and where their uh, where their habitat is appropriate to them. So we have this rapids just upstream that is a lot of uh, light water, which is infusing oxygen into the uh, the water, and then we have a lot of boulders out here, and we have large boulders, and we have small boulders. And those are all places where fish like to hang out in transition areas between fast and slow, shallow and deep. And that's where their, uh, their food hangs out too. So I'm right along the edge here and I've been noticing, I hope they haven't crawled away, there's a number of uh, stick case caddis here. And these stick case caddis, they look like just a little twig. But inside there, there is a caddis larva, which looks sort of like the grubs that eat your uh, grass, like a Japanese beetle grub. And I'm just going to pull him out of this little uh, case that he made himself. And... This is a piece of the case, and that's the caddis larva. And you can see he's quite a nice uh, chunk of protein, and it is an insect, and they don't bite us. They, uh, they eat decaying vegetable matter that's around the rocks, and they actually crawl around, and they make this little case that they live in for protection. And as it so happened, on the same, not the same rock, but a couple of rocks over, in the faster water, I pulled out this stonefly, which is a predator that eats caddis larva. And we can see the stonefly has these uh, very long antenna. They're probably almost the length of his uh, body without his tail. And he has little armor plates on his back that are articulated. And he's a very strong crawler. If I let go of his tail, he's just going to take off like a shot. And if I turn him over, we'll see that he has a yellowish belly. And when it's time for them, this is the immature uh, stonefly. When it's time for this guy and gal to uh, reproduce as adults, they crawl up out of the water onto these boulders, a la the stones and their back splits open and the adult crawls out. So they go through a metamorphosis inside that exoskeleton. And when they come out of their exoskeleton, they're a very uh, sort of greenish yellow color, quite bright. And then their belly stays yellow even afterwards. And we'll uh, look at some flies. Okay, I 
I pulled up a couple, a couple other rocks here that were a little closer to the rapids. One of them is one the stone climb is on. Let's see if uh, any of them still have the insects on the gym when I, when I pull them up. So there's over 500 species of caddis and, uh, and mayflies, which we haven't talked about yet. But all these little uh, bits of sand and gravel attached to this rock are put there by the caddis larva. The ones we looked at a minute ago, the really big ones, those are what we call a stick case caddis. And these are called the saddle caddis. I'm going to put this down for a minute and we're going to look at a saddle caddis. The reason it's called a saddle is it has underneath it, probably need a microscope to see this, but it's like a little uh, cinch, like a horse that holds the saddle on. So the uh, caddis larva has built this little house and he, he doesn't move around, he just sits inside there and eats the decaying vegetable matter that comes and uh, filters down onto his rock. And when it's time for this one to hatch, he's gonna be a lot smaller than the, um, the stick case caddis. The stick case caddis is it, it will start hatching in September and October as adults. And they'll be quite a large orange colored um, adult. It'll look like an orange moth. And the saddle case caddis are much more prolific. There are many, many of these. And they will be swarms of like small moth-like looking creatures. And they'll start hatching. The, in fact, we may see some today. It's a little breezy, so they don't like to come out in the breeze. They get knocked down on the water. Um, but there are like, just on this one rock, there's quite a number of these uh, saddle caddis. Yeah. If we take the caddis larva outside of his little case, we can see it looks just like a little bean. And what he's done is he's made like a sleeping bag and sealed himself in it. So he's going through a metamorphosis right now. Um, he's going through what we call a pupation period. So when it's time for this guy to hatch as an adult and, and swim up to the surface, the pupa is what is going to swim up to the surface because these little larvae, they can't swim. They can barely crawl around. And this guy can't even crawl around. He just stuck to his rock and he stays there until he it's time to be an adult uh, caddis. What do you think, about two bazillion of them? I think you can get that many. There is everywhere. and right here in the bushes and the alders. Flew in right under there. You can look up through them and see them on the leaves, see them up there. Mm -hmm. They're coming right in. They lay right under the leaves. Or right on top of them. You can also see some of this little uh, sand that is not in the shape of a, of a structure, but it is connected to the rock. And that's from what's called a net building caddis. They don't build an actual structure, but they'll spin a web and they will anchor it to the rock with some sand and some gravel. And they will also eat the decaying uh, vegetable matter. This might be a little tricky because these are also uh, 
very active crawlers. They have to be strong crawlers because they're on a rock crawling around out in the current and uh, they have to be quick to avoid getting eaten by stoneflies. So I'm going to put them on the back of my hand. This is a uh, mayfly nymph. I know that because when we saw the stonefly, well I know it's not a caddis larva because he doesn't look like a grub. So he has a, a dark brown body and a long slender tail. You can see his tail is like longer than the length of his body. He's very flat looking. If I turn him over, we can see that he also has a light colored uh, belly. Now, without being a entomologist, I can't, I can't tell you what the specific species of mayfly this is, so I can't tell you exactly when he will be hatching as an adult or what color he will be. But typically in, uh, in the rivers around here, we would see, well, hopefully in a little while, we're gonna to go to another spot where we typically get what we call the Hendrickson hatch, which is Latin name is uh, Ephemerella subvaria, but who cares about that? The, the only thing is we know that it's, a, we call a Hendrickson. This guy is too small to be one of those, he could be what we call a blue wing olive. He could be what we call a sulfur, which is a yellow mayfly that'll hatch uh, in the evening. Sometimes they're called pale evening duns. Um, so it's, it's likely, and the flies, when we look at the flies that imitate these, they will have that tapered abdomen, a slender tail. And sometimes they'll have either a little bit of color or flash in them. You see this will be sort of a iridescent looking uh, sort of a greenish pale yellow color. So those are mayflies and we have uh, very many varieties of those. Uh, we'll show some uh, uh, video uh, most likely of the hexagenia mayfly which is about over two inches long. It hatches in the late evening in uh, late June and through July. So that's the mayfly. And in this kind of water, uh, they would be the crawler kinds of mayflies that would be stuck, you know, be crawling around on the rocks, under the rocks, eating, once again, decaying vegetable matter. That's good. Hold it there. It's a hexagenia mayfly coming out of its shuck. It's about almost 8 o'clock on July 3rd. We're making our first trip up, we've heard that the hex hatch is out, and this sort of confirms it. This, this one is hatching out of his out of his shuck right here on the water. This is a perfect time for the fish to nail them, except we're sitting right on top of them, watching them. This, this is going to repeat itself hundreds of times tonight, hopefully. Knock on aluminum. Okay, so the big fly that I pulled out from the rock there that was scrambling around was a stone fly. And we have <coughs> various sizes and colors of stone flies. Uh, this one's sort of a greenish color. This is what you might call like a root beer color, which is dark brown and orange mottled. Uh, we have black ones, whatever. The idea is this, this guy might get washed off a rock 
go drifting downstream. Stoneflies can't swim. They're very strong crawlers and they got little hooks on the end of their, their legs and they can grab onto rocks in fast water. And they go and they stick that antenna inside the uh, crevices in the rocks trying to sense a caddis and they dig it out and they eat it. But they can get washed off and when they do, they will drift with the current until they bump into a rock or they sink down to the bottom. And the technique that we uh, use to fish for them uh, is to use a what we call a nymph kind of a fly. This happens to be a stonefly nymph. And it will, some of them we have weights on them, but we can put weights on our leader and sink it down near the bottom. And it's a special technique that we use to have a drift, uh, and a dead drift with the current. So it drifts with the same speed as all the other food that the fish are used to eating. When it time, comes time for the stonefly to hatch, they'll crawl up onto a boulder on the edge of the stream or out in the middle of the stream, and their back splits open and the adult crawls out. And this is basically the fly that we use to imitate it. It has a yellow belly. Sometimes we'll use an olive color, sometimes a little bit more orange. Oftentimes around their head they might have a little orange and this also helps as far as visibility. This fly is called a stimulator but it's uh, intended to imitate the mature stone fly. So this fly will, because it doesn't hatch up out of the water, it hatches off a rock. When they mate, the, the males and females will fly over the water and mate and oftentimes they'll fall onto the water. The females will dip down and do what's called ovipositing, which is to drop their eggs on the water. But the least little bit of wind when they're near the water, they can get knocked down on the water and they'll struggle to get up. And that's when they're vulnerable to be eaten. They're a good sized piece of protein, represent good energy to the trout. And uh, if you see the exoskeletons, we'll show some of those uh, separately from, uh, from the office. I have collected a few exoskeletons, and if we see any, I didn't see any in the rocks today. But uh, if you see those exoskeletons, good idea, tie on a stimulator. Good size fly, about a size uh, anywhere from an 8 to a 12 or 14. And this is, this is probably about a size 10 stimulator. So that's what the stonefly uh, imitations look like. And Caddis, we said that those are often the most prolific that you will see in a, uh, in a river. And they have a couple of flies here that imitate the caddis larva. This one for his head has a, a, uh, a little tungsten bead, a little dark bead. This uh, species uh, imitates a net building caddis, which is a, a bright green. Sometimes uh, they're called green rock worms, uh, just sort of colloquially. And these will also drift with the current. Net building caddis will crawl around, but they'll hang on to their net, but they could get dislodged from their net. Um, and some of them will actually spin a web that might somewhat resemble a spider web, but they'll crawl around on that web and uh, they might get washed off. So these are caddis larvae. When they get ready to hatch, they go into that pupation stage where they'll seal themselves up into a, a little cocoon. When they come out, they can't, uh, they can't fly yet. They are a pupa, and, but the pupa can swim like the dickens and it swims up to the surface. And that's what we use uh, typically would be some type of an emerger. And this style of emerger we call a soft hackle. The name of this fly is a partridge in orange. It has a little partridge feather and an orange body. Um, two days ago, I was fishing this river and the next spot we're gonna go to and uh, not to brag, but I got three nice browns just drifting this and then letting it swing up to the surface. And I got three nice browns who thought that this was a uh, caddis uh, pupa that was drifting in the current and coming up to hatch as an adult. Okay, so uh, we looked at the caddis larva and we looked at the uh, soft tackle that imitates the pupa. Now let's look at a couple caddis adult flies. Caddis, you'll notice that neither of these flies have a tail on them. Caddis don't have a tail. The uh, mayfly does, and the stonefly has kind of a stubby tail that they use for kind of balance and uh, 
in the faster water. The caddis don't have a tail, so the, the, they do have uh, antenna, and these are tied with antenna. Hopefully we can see those. They're very thin, but they're about the length of the body. Sometimes they're actually twice the length of the body in, the, in what we call the alder fly or zebra caddis. They have a, about over two inch long, um, almost three inch long antenna. And uh, their body is about uh, an inch and a quarter to an inch and a half long. So their body is actually about an inch and a quarter and then their wings extends beyond that. That's neither here nor there. This is called an elk hair caddis. The wing on the back is uh, made of, uh, of elk hair. It does have a little hackle in front, sort of like a, uh, a stimulator. This one has an olive colored body. This one is uh, a darker caddis. In a, in a size a little bit larger than this, we would uh, use that to imitate the, uh, the alder fly, something about like that size, which is about another one or two sizes larger than, uh, than this one. So they have a wing that is down on their back, sort of like a moth. We said the mayfly's wing is, up, wing is upright like a sailboat. The caddis uh, are tented on their back uh, like a moth. And when these guys fly, they are like a moth. Hopefully we'll see some flying around and we might be able to get some pictures of them in a little while. Uh, but they are very erratic, very quick flying. Okay, let's talk about the, uh, the mayfly a little bit. We, we saw one pretty small mayfly uh, nymph. <clears throat> and remember I said it has a tapered abdomen, a very thin tail, and it is an insect. It does have six legs. And that's what these little feathers are tended to imitate here, is this little thorax, a dark thorax, and then the legs. They will crawl around on the rocks. Some species of uh, mayfly, uh, like the Isonychia, is an active swimmer, but you don't really uh, see those unless you're netting them. Most of the time you turn over a rock, you're going to see something that might be a, a, uh, a betus, a Blue wing olive, the uh, Will Gordon, something like that. And the adults, so when this guy is uh, ready to hatch out as an adult and be able to mate and lay eggs, he'll go through a metamorphosis inside his exoskeleton. So he's crawling around on the bottom, he's going through a metamorphosis. And when he gets ready to hatch, Inside his exoskeleton will develop a little air bubble and it'll make him buoyant and he'll float up and he'll start swimming up and as he gets up to the surface he'll sit in the surface film and his back pops open and the adult crawls out onto the surface of the water. So we can use a darker colored uh, soft hackle to imitate the emerging uh, mayfly or there are other patterns that we use that, it, that are intended to imitate any given species of mayfly. Uh, I like to use a, um, a soft tackle that has the body color appropriate to the fly we're imitating. So they drift up to the surface, they sit quietly on the surface because unlike the caddis, they don't just pop out and start flying away. They have to, their wings have to dry out, their wings are upright like a little sailboat. and they'll be sitting on the surface of the water trying not to draw attention to themselves and they'll be dead they'll be drifting with the surface of the water with everything else on the surface typically bubbles if we look out there we see all this organic matter bubbles that are churned up from rapids and they will cause uh, they will form into foam lines and trout will hang around those foam lines because that's where water is pushing the foam, their food, together on the surface, and they'll be feeding. And we'll be looking for uh, either dimples or splashy little rises with fish feeding on the surface, and that's the dry fly. And then, after they hatch and they mate, before they, the female lays their eggs, they will molt, and we use flies that have this little yellow egg on the tip of the abdomen and that would be the, a female fly 
And when there is an active hatch going on, many times the uh, females are laying eggs in a very late afternoon, early evening, late evening, and the fish will key in on those that have that yellow spot because it represents, it must taste better to them. It's more protein, more calories to them. It's a little egg. So um, when they're hatching, they're more indiscriminate. They'll eat any of them because they all have a lot of energy. But after they mate, the males fall in the water and die. The females are get ready to uh, lay their eggs and they still have lots of energy in them. They're still uh, nice and plump full of energy. They can fly around and they will deposit their eggs on the surface. And these are the flies that we use to imitate the, uh, the females. Uh, so if it looks to you like a moth or a bunch of moths out over the water, that's 99% sure they're not moths, they're cats. If you see something that is er erratic, but not fast, maybe like a bumblebee, that's probably a stonefly flying around out over the water. And if you see something that is a little smaller than a bumblebee, but sort of very steady, but, and, but slowly flying around, that's likely to be a mayfly. And we kind of fish them the same way. The, the adult uh, hatching mayfly, we fish it a dead drift. The caddis, we can dead drift and alternate by twitching it on the surface, what we call skating. And uh, the stonefly, we would also do what we call twitching and skating, give it a little commotion on the surface because they don't belong on the surface when they're adults. They're trying to get up off the water. They're either laying eggs and got caught or they got blown down onto the surface of the water. So those are the major uh, aquatic insects that we fish, that we try to imitate. We try to find out where they are, identify them, 